Paul Spock. This Week and Each Week is brought to you by Game Toppers. So be sure to check them out at GameToppersLLC.com. Welcome to Game All Night. Well, hello and welcome to Game All Night. I'm your host, Chris Whippan. Joined with me always, not always, he has been he hasn't been here for the last two shows, but he's here now, and that's all that matters, ladies and gentlemen. Bartender Dan is in the house, and Bartender Dan is looking a little little worse for the wear because I, I stole his camera. So um, I apologize for that that picture, but we're gonna he's not on screen very much today anyway, so it might be an improvement. There you go. This it's better punish- than Canadian Dan in any event. This is my punishment for my uh, disappearing act for a couple <laughs> episodes in a row that uh, you, you've, you've downgraded my hardware. Yes, yes. You are now 480p, boy. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, real quick, what are we drinking, Dan? Okay. So, um, we uh, we are on, on different wavelengths here. I'm going with a little low ABV uh, session IPA from Founders. Okay. Uh, that's probably not showing up on camera right now. Um, the, it's all uh, green. That's a problem. The, the, I, I do. It is a quest of mine to continue to find beers that will show up as transparent on the green screen. Um, but Founders All Day IPA, which is a lovely little session uh, session pale ale, uh, whereas you're very much in the other direction with with dark and uh, and drinky with the uh, the Christmas favorite Mad Elf from Trogues. Right. So for those of you who watch us in a timely fashion, this is our wrap up episode of the year. This is the last one we're doing in 2019. So I thought I'd go out with a bang with some Mad Elf because it's just a big, big, bad 12 percenter uh, and a lot of fun. Well, anyway, we have Mr. Ted Allspock hanging in the green room. So let's kick it over. How are you doing, Mr. Ted? Is everything well in your land? (laughs) It is going great. Um, Just got back from PAX and yeah, uh, fantastic. Glad to be here. Awesome. So you went to PAX as well. So we finally got to to meet. I think uh, the last time you weren't up or was it just uh, didn't work out? Yeah, well, um, the last two packs we've gone, the company's gone, but I have mm-hmm. not gone. Uh, right. Kind of recovering from Essen and everything else, and you can only go to so many trade shows in a year. So, but I was glad to get to packs finally. Awesome. So, what did you? Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, my local con. So, I go and help out at Capstone uh, and hang out in the booth. I love it. I love to see the growth year after year. Um, but what was your uh, what was your take on our our little con of the East? Yeah, I mean, we had heard you know, the staff had gone uh, previously that a lot of the folks going there weren't that much gamers and whatever. But this year kind of proved them wrong because there mm. were gamers coming out the wazoo. There, it was it was packed. Uh, you know, we sold a ton of products there. We were, our booth was constantly packed, showing off games. Uh, it was great. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see kind of the size of it, and you can kind of see the potential it has going forward. That's going to get bigger and, and hopefully even better. Awesome. Awesome. So, so I kind of have to ask what was kind of the, the biggest mover? I have my idea. I have a thought, like what, what did you sell the most of? Well, in this case, it was silver for us. That's a okay. new game that came out uh, this year. Um, but oddly enough, uh, because of the previous couple of years, the, the you know percentage of gamer to casual gamer was pretty low. We right. didn't really bring a lot of our strategy games. We brought um, okay. not very many copies of uh, the new suburbia collectors edition. Mm-hmm. And those went and they sold out uh, in the first couple hours of the show. So oh, uh, we, holy we learned our lessons. But yeah, yeah, that, that would have been probably one of the biggest sellers, maybe not by units, but certainly by sales amount because it's such a big box and kind of a pricey thing. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was that was great. It was totally unexpected and uh, was very excited. And we were sad that we had to tell a lot of people that we didn't have any more copies throughout the rest of the show. Interesting. Now, are you still seeing like where words or is it one night or what are some of the ones that consistently are are played a lot because i i think where words is one of the most replayable games and genre non-specific right i i where words is um where words and one night are our two top sellers in terms of Mm. you know the just 
year after year for the last several years, um, they've just been doing amazingly well. Uh, and that's followed up uh, very, very, very closely behind by the original Ultimate Werewolf, okay. which still is, you know, for, for everything that people are like, oh, there's limitations because you have uh, elimination and lots of people, it still sells really, really well. And, you know, people are buying copies all the time on that. So Interesting. Uh, Interesting. I, um, I'm, I, I kind of have to, to gush. I think when I kind of started the show back, I guess we're going on two years now, um, which is scary at one point. But um, you were definitely one of the people I wanted to get on early on. Like, cause I, I kind of always admired what you did with Bezier and I'm not just trying to gush here. I'm just, this is legit. Like when I got into the hobby in 2012, um, suburbia was a legit grail game because it was hard to find. It was like, I'm like, it's a, it's a tile placement game. It's a city builder. This is, this was one of the first ones I saw that I'm like, I have to seek this out and get it. So Eventually, I found it, and I didn't, you know, sell Firstborn to get it, but it was not cheap either. <laughs> yeah, well, that was that's our fault. Um, you know, one of the things you know, we've we've been around as a company now, you know, more than ten years, but sure. we've always done very small games, and Suburbia was really our first big box game. And uh, you know, as any, this is we didn't do it through Kickstarter; we you know funded it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's very scary to take the plunge on a big box game. You know, there's a lot of components, and sure. just it's expensive and so we did not print that many copies and uh you know we found out when it was it you know exceeded our expectations in terms of sales and we had to go you know pretty much straight to reprint you know our second printing right after i think it was s in of 2012 um because all the copies that we had printed were were gone you know within within a few weeks and of course you know it takes whenever you gain something overseas whether at, at that point <laughs> it, was Germany, it takes you know four months to get it from initial like you press the button and say yes i want more copies to when you get it and right. <laughs> uh that's so four months go by and we get another chunk in and then those sell out super fast and you know we keep up, upping the amount but of course we want to be careful with that too because, you know, we're gonna have to reach saturation at some point but um you know had we known now what we knew then we wouldn't have had that problem we would have printed a big chunk in the beginning and would have saved us money because you know it's always cheaper to print in volume anyway sure. but uh you know who knew um, so yeah, that, that's totally our fault for not anticipating uh, the demand of the game at the time, which, you know, I'm thankful for, but boy, I wish I had known, uh, that would have saved a lot of just frustration. I think on the part of gamers trying to get, like you said, trying to get copies, trying to find some in the first, like 2013, it was scarce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it really was. Like, but you know, we really there's... Had no idea. right. But there's the upside to that too, because I think that does help keep the buzz alive. And it's not like you were doing that thing that, you know, Z-Man, you know, was known for in in the mid-teens there where they would print a copy and then they would just wait forever to hit the reprint button. Like Terra Mystica, yeah. remember when that went out, that took twice as long to come back in as, say, yeah. you know, Suburbia. So I get it. It's like you can't, you can't afford to print like 10,000 copies if you don't know how it's going to do. You know, sure. it just it's just if you look at the Venn diagram of people who loved SimCity and people who love board games, I think that overlap ended up being pretty big. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it definitely. And it, it definitely I, I think we hit the sweet spot in terms of the, the the depth and, you know, how it made it as accessible as we could and still give you that city building feel. So and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled how it turned out. You know, it, we did the collector's edition recently to cover up for some of the, what I consider some of the shortcomings of the original okay. edition uh, in terms of the artwork and just, you know, some of the components were just not up to where they would be had we produced the game, you know, six, seven years later. Sure. Um, so, you know, it was great to be able to, to revisit that. And I am so happy, you know, I think the first time I got my first kind of the sample version of the collector's edition with the recessed boards and all that stuff. I was so excited. I'm just, you know, this, like this is what I had originally had envisioned, but we knew we could not do back then. Yeah. Um, and also, the, I think the, the technology for things like recess boards kind of mm -hmm. sucked back in, in 2012. That's not that sure. long ago, but um, the they fact used that we were like crazy back then. Exactly. Exactly. They, that just happened all the time. And right. uh, the ones that we have, there's no warping, and there's some techniques and some things I think that the, the manufacturers have learned, but there's also, you know, just the technology to, to create games has improved mm -hmm. and 
Uh, wow, uh, what a difference um, between that and the original version. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we were able to do that. I literally had everything for the original version. I made a foam core insert for it and everything. As soon as you announced that, I'm like out the door because I certainly want the new one because it was, and it's, when it showed up, it, there are times when the box shows up and you just know that you're in trouble. Like this box was huge. It was like one unit, one box. Like it was big. Yeah. And I didn't even, and I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't spring for all the extra cities because I'm like, this probably gets played a handful of time of years. Um, I, would, I wouldn't mind a few extra colors. That would be fun. But at the same time, I'm like, Oh, it's it's so much it's so much and it's absolutely gorgeous you're right like the nice thick the bigger tiles um yeah. you know i there was a 3d printer who wanted to make little buildings and little you know 3d printed things to put on tiles to represent what they were um mm -hmm. so that like you could spot airports and restaurants and things and you kind of address that very simply and elegantly with some nice tokens that now go out and uh, it's just, wow. If if you like city building games, I don't think anything, even to this date, there's nothing I think that really kind of hits that SimCity nerve quite like Suburbia does. And it's just, well done, yeah. sir. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, like I said, super thrilled with how it turned out. Um, you know, that's, if I could go back to 2012, Ted, and say, just hold on, it'll be, it'll be awesome eventually. Just, you know, get there, I think. I would have uh, I would have been incredibly pleased. I wouldn't have believed 2019 Ted, obviously, sure. because first of all, no such thing as time travel. Second of all, uh, <laughs> so you said, boy, uh, you know, <laughs> really, really, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna be able to afford to do something, you know, that's that's that awesome. I don't think so, but uh, yeah, it turned out fantastic. So I'm thrilled with it. Yeah, absolutely. So Nat, let let's rewind. There there's something that is a consistency between all of your the games that kind of fit in this this category and that is the hex tile so so why did it start as hexes and what kind of because like all of the sim city players and everything we we're used to squares i mean that's kind of that's what we were given so where did the idea for the hex kind of grow out of yeah it was um during play testing it was squares there were square tiles for i would say about a year and a half of the original mm. design and play testing and um I, you know, to be honest, I don't know what the trigger was that went with hexes. Um, you know, I'm, I, I like games like Age of Steam and other games that use hexes in a lot of interesting ways. But, uh, you know, the, the day that that happened, uh, I realized, wow, this just turns up that whole interac interactivity and adjacency just mm. to 11. It just, it made it so much better. And it, you know, at, at the time, you know, when you, when you, Look at that, and in hindsight, you're like, well, of course, why didn't I think of that sooner? It's so obvious. But, you know, at the time, I was in that same um, mode that you were thinking, well, you know, it's a city builder, it's square. There are squares. Right. That's, you think in city, it's kind of your initial square chunks of, of, uh, of land that you're, you're zoning. And, and uh, to, to think of it in a hex is such an unusual thing that it just hadn't occurred to me until a certain amount of, of playtesting in. In fact, there was, it was playtested. It had been put away for about six months and then it came back and when i was i was looking at it that's when something happened that i decided you know what i'll try it with with hexes and see because of that you know the extra two extra sides per per hex and right. wow that just made such a difference and after that you know the development just got so much better and the game you know got fantastic as a result so ted i on behalf of all middle-aged gamers everywhere i just wanted to say Thank you so much because you made the residential green, you made the business blue, and you made the industry yellow. Come on, that should be standardized, people, right? So that that is exactly what it should be. I mean, anyone who's <laughs> sort of that is those are the colors. And uh, even if you played the black and white version, you'd know those are the colors somehow, right? So, so I came in SimCity two. Like as soon as it started getting three D and crazy, like we we used to be able to. Like, and I, and I have to ask, I guess that's where the, the idea for all the tiles and the buildings and the graphic design to be isolinear, isometric. Yeah. That's what it's I'm the looking for. The look was definitely inspired by SimCity, um, you know, right. as those colors were too, because that's the sort of thing that 
it just felt right. You know, it felt like the right style for that. Yeah. You know, why? if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, I was drawing the Tri America Tower in SimCity 2000, like, because <laughs> it had, like, the little building editor that you could do that. Yeah. It looks a little funny, though, when they were just popping up in commercial districts all over the place. I'm like, there's not quite that many in real life. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what? I, I think this is a great place to pause because I want to come back and talk about some other stuff. So we're going to take a, a short break and we're going to be right back after this. Pontifications with Patrick Hillier. When past, present, and future go camping, they always argue. It's intense, tense, intense. Hello, my name is Chris Wipan, and I'm the host of Game All Night. I'm also a self-proclaimed collector, crazy person, whatever. Of course, I have my quiver that I carry around that has all my games in it. I have an extra quiver that I used to carry my portable studio with. And if that's not enough, portable bar inside your quiver. So believe me when I tell you that I always get very excited whenever I hear a new product is coming from the guys over at Quiver. And this is no exception. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. It's got this great leather wrap. The way it actually closes, there's no steps, there's nothing visible. It's actually magnetic. Let's try that again. Can you hear this? I love that. It's just, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So of course, once you open it up, it's going to be that premium quiver quality. And inside my current favorite, medium, these guys think of everything. This clear plastic cover is going to slide down and it fits so snugly, I can tip this and I know it's not gonna come out. And of course, you have that nice snap. So there you have it. Check it out, the Quiver Citadel. And welcome back. And not only did my guests not leave, we had a lovely chat about PAX and bestowing the virtues of a well-run con and band that came through while we were cleaning up after Sunday. It was right so there's this point where you go oh cons usually close at four on sunday you're like oh wait we close at six and then all of a sudden yeah. a band comes through at six and you're like okay maybe this isn't so bad <laughs> yeah you know what? i agree because that was one of the things we were talking about like what times to close on sunday six really why would they stay open until six but as we're cleaning up at 605 or whatever a was what it a 10 piece band comes through yeah and that was awesome they just walk throughout the exhibit hall and I mean, nothing, nothing better to clean up with than a live band. That was, that was awesome. So well done, Matt Morgan and PAX people. That was, that was something very special. I just, I really enjoyed yeah. that. So yeah, that was neat. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll dump some, some of that stuff at the end too, but it was uh well done anyway, back to the show. So we were, we were kind of talking a little bit about your choices for suburbia, but that's not what got your start. You actually started doing, if I'm not mistaken here, Age of Steam maps. Was that, is that correct? Is that what you first did? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's part of it. It's, it's kind of a weird sort of thing. Um, technically, my first game that, that was published was a Seismic that Atlas Games produced. Okay. Um, and that was 2005, something like that. It's hmm. on BGG, anyone can figure that out. Somewhere around there, but quite a while back. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, I've been designing games and they were all crap. And, uh, you know, Atlas saw Seismic and said, hey, this is just above crap. So maybe we'll publish. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you're awesome. thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was my first game that was published. And about that time, I think I had been working on some uh, AGC expansion maps. And, uh, you know, I, I ended up uh, taking one with me. Again, I think it was around 2005. I'm not sure the exact year. I took one with me to Essen. I, I met up with John Bohr, who's the um, developer for Winsome Games and designer for Winsome Games. And they published the first, uh, you know, they worked with um, Martin on Age of Steam and uh, got that out the door. And he invited me to sell copies of my maps in his booth that year. And so that was pretty exciting. So that was the first time that I sold anything, you know, for myself 
as opposed right. to having it published by someone else. And uh, it was a Bay Area map. I lived in the Bay Area, and I thought this would be a great place to you know do a an Asia Steam map for that area. And uh, I sold, I think I had 40 or 50 copies, and they sold out pretty much instantly within an hour. Um, and uh, it's never been reprinted. I did a different version of it called Northern California, but the original Bay Area one is, if you have an original copy of that, there are only, like I said, less than 50 copies in existence at wow. the time. So. Um, and people have asked to redo it, and it's kind of a nice little thing. I'm like, no, I like the idea that there's something, you know, that's that, you know, uh, <laughs> hard to get, hard to find. It's kind of cool. Um, so I don't even have a copy of it myself of the original one. So um, I could, suppose I could print one out at this point. But I, I like the idea again that it's that elusive, you know, kind of a hard a little grail thing for train gamers to be able to find. Yeah. And 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 those of you who listen to the sister. Uh, broadcast that we do us train gamers love our grail stuff because pretty much our entire catalog is grail game <laughs> yeah, not a lot of copies of, of train games are always produced for, for especially when it comes to expansions and maps and things like that right it's like we think because we want it that there's high demand but when you compare it to you know things that are going in barnes and nobles and targets and things like that the demand is if it's under, what do you, what would you say, five thousand? If it's under five thousand, oh, yeah. it's yeah. kind of low demand. Let's be honest. Yes. And we're yeah, we're happy. One... I, and I think the uh, the new version of eighteen sixty seven only had like a. I, I don't quote me on this. It was around a thousand backers. So that's still not. Yeah. It's not mainstream money yet, but. Nope. No, but, but it's a labor of love. I mean, I, I loved, I love making those maps. Um, you know, I don't know. I did 20 some, maybe 30 some, I don't know. A lot of expansion maps for Age Steam. <laughs> I love making those. I love Age of Steam. I still love Age of Steam. Uh, I got a little burnout, I think, because I did it so much. But, right. Uh, boy, that was a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoyed that. And it was a great, great way to dip my toe into publishing and design without, uh, you know, going too far in. And, uh, doing something that I might regret later um, because, you know, I had there, there was that core of people who just loved getting new maps and doing things and they seemed to like the ones I was doing. So that worked out really well. Right. Now, where you start, did you start with like paper maps or did you like, you went from paper yeah. to mounted to? Yeah. Yeah. The, the very first map that a Bay Area map was uh, just basically printed on, I guess the statute of limitations is up now, but it was printed on a test printer at Adobe when I worked there. Mm -hmm. um and you know i went and bought a roll of paper and some ink cartridges and i used one of the test printers there in the, the qa group there so hopefully the adobe folks aren't listening and they're gonna come at me for the electricity and the time that i was there late at night printing out a bunch of maps on their stuff don't worry uh, they'll just charge you a subscription oh. fee now that's fine that's yeah fine. I, I bought my paper and the ink so it's, <laughs> it's probably fine but, um i didn't ask anyone i just kind of did it because i figured oh it's they, they won't care as long as i have my own stuff but I never, I never asked for it. Anyway, that was paper. And then I, I got my own uh, format printer that I did some things on. And um, the, and even those a lot, I would, I would print them on cardstock. And I didn't, you know, when I got them professionally printed, they were still on cardstock, like folded cardstock. And uh, it wasn't for quite a while until I, I did the first one. I think it was um, the Mississippi Steamboats and Golden Spike one was probably the first one that was actually mm. mounted. Uh, one okay, and uh, then I started doing some mounted ones along with some paper ones. Uh, I still want to do, and it's I know it's it's probably not worth it, but one of the the maps that's rated well and one of my personal favorites is the the Disco Inferno slash Soul Train map. <laughs> uh, the and I love that Disco Inferno map. And the Soul Train one's really cool too. It's 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 a it's just a fun thematic thing and. Uh, that was done on paper, unfortunately, and I would love to do a real mounted version of that at some point when I have the time. And I'm sure we could, I could probably get a couple hundred people to, to buy copies of it so it wouldn't be a total waste. But, well, what um, I think you need to do is I think you need to just like, this is what like Kickstarter is designed for, right? You put that up, you see if yeah. there's enough interest, and then you buy the time from yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yes, because I can play that with my Steam board because because Age of Steam kicks my butt three ways to Sunday, so I'm more of a Steam ah. fan. But uh, I can still use the board. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, you know, I, I made everything uh, Steam compatible. I started once Steam came out, everything, you know, I rooted the rules for everything to make sure that worked with Steam and all the new stuff worked with both Steam and Age of Steam. And I just got uh, a few months ago, I got the deluxe edition of Age of Steam that that Eagle put out. Uh. 
So I, that's that was difference. that was maybe going to be a pickup at PAX, but they didn't bring it. So thankfully, I don't have to pick it up I yet. They didn't sell it at Essen either. I don't understand why they would not do that. Well, they but, weren't there. So yeah. Well, yeah. It seems strange that they yeah. wouldn't be at PAX. Maybe Origins. We'll see. We'll see. But again, I don't... <laughs> Aegis, I, I really want it for the artwork and everything, but Aegis theme... They, you know what it is, Ted? There's something about loans that... And, and it's funny because it's not true in real life at all, actually. But there's something about loans in a game that just stresses me out <laughs> to no end. And you start way in the hole in Steam. In Steam. An age of yeah, yeah, specifically. You cannot play it. You, you essentially are, you've taken a loan out at the very beginning of the game that you, you're going to owe. Basically you take a loan to bid on um, when do you want to go. <laughs> yeah. That's rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is not a friend. It is the game hates you. The game hates you. It wants to smack you down. It, want to make, it wants to make you suffer and it likes to make you suffer. It does. Um, but that's. Uh, yeah, and that, but you know, I, I think for me, Age of Steam was definitely one of the factors that inspired the way that those wonderful red lines in Spurbia work. Uh, okay. That they they kick you down. You know, you get yeah, that's great. I'm doing great with my city. Oh no, now I have to pay this overhead cost suddenly. You know, once that my population has reached a certain point, point. Um, and that's that's definitely that feel that I like. That you're constantly have that pressure of you know I, I want to get bigger, but as I do it, um, it's harder and harder and harder, and I kind of have to keep struggling. You know, to get up that hill. And which I is kind of like that in a game. Which is directly in Railroad Tycoon, because that has the exact same thing. Where they're like, "Oh, I'm starting to make income." Wait, what? What? It's going backwards. It's not supposed to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Railroad Tycoon, they just do have that horrible thing that you get that Evil. cliff, and you're like, oh "My gosh, I just got one extra income. I do that. I shouldn't have. No, I didn't want to do." And it's, you know. <laughs> So, so fast forward, you know, the, the 10, 10 or so years and we're in today, what is, what is front and foremost in your design vocabulary now that you're working on these days? So, so it's funny. We're, we're talking before about, you know, some of the things that are coming up, but we were talking about agency. I am actually working on a train game right now. So uh, yes. that's something that's coming out soon and I'm super excited about it. I don't have a lot of details because things are going to change probably. Sure. But uh, hopefully, as in next year, we'll, we'll see that. And uh, I'm, I love pick up and deliver games. I mean, I, I love that sort of style. And I have always been frustrated. You know, the one thing I'm frustrated with Age of Steam is not, not how it beats you down. I'm used to right. that. I kind of like, I don't <laughs> like that you have to explain thematically how it works to people. This whole idea of, oh, you're setting up routes and you're kind of licensing out these routes to these companies that are shipping these goods permanently. You're not really delivering. You're not picking up a good and taking it. You're saying right. that this good is going to go here. And now I'm saying that, okay, you're going to use this railing to do this for the rest of the game. And you're kind of setting that, that up going forward. That concept, while I get it, it's, it's really, it, it's a stretch for a lot of people. Right. Um, because they're thinking, oh, that cube is a good and I'm taking it and delivering it. But then, what? How does how does that? How do I get income that's sustained for several turns after that? And so, uh, the, the game I'm working on addresses that sort of thing because I don't mm. like that. I like that it much more clear cut. If you could deliver goods, you know that sort of thing. Uh, okay. When you actually get, you know, when you deliver it, you get paid, and that's it. And you want to get paid again, you got to deliver something else. Um, so that's that's for me. You know, I, I, to kind of bring it back to where I think a lot of people are able to you know relate to pick up and deliver and it makes a little mm -hmm. bit more sense kind of that, that abstractness that that agency has but anyway that's that's something we're going in the future right now what i've been working on for the last couple of years and what i'll be working on also is uh, silver which okay. is a game that was that debuted this year at gen con and and at essen and uh so that's that's kind of been my like my little baby that i've been working on and i'm excited about because uh it's it's an expandable card game system that uh, has two releases so far, Silver and Silver Bullet this year. Uh, okay. Next year, we'll have three more, and uh, probably a few more the year after that. So uh, super excited about that, and that's that's definitely taking up a, a big chunk of my time. So what makes what makes Silver something special that maybe like another, I don't play a ton of card games. Uh, like I definitely don't play any L or CCGs. Like. Even though my friend does apparently and just won the Keyforge tournament at PAX U, which is 
congratulations, Nick, if you're watching. Um, but I don't generally play them, but I'll I'll play like the I'll play the llama or the Tichu. Like I'll play some stuff. So what kind of sets silver apart and what makes it what makes it sell out at S and, and PAX? <laughs> yeah, so um Several years ago, um, I was introduced to to Cabo, and uh, Cabo is this game where it's a card shedding game where you're trying to reduce the number of points you have by either you know changing the values of the cards you have, mm -hmm. making them lower and lower, or by just removing cards and having fewer cards, which also reduces the sum of your cards. Uh, there's other games that are like the traditional game called Golf. There's Rat Tat Cat. It's just a, a Sky Joe. There's a, there's a bunch of games that are in this category that do similar sorts of things where you're you're reducing your cards. You're trying to get rid of cards. And, um, you know, as I've been playing a lot of those, <clears throat> um, for us, uh, Cabo was one that really just, you know, just struck a nerve like, ah, oh, we like this. Um, but it, it's fairly simple. I mean, it's super accessible, which is great, but it, there's not that much to it as a, you know, for a gamer. And uh, we, we actually um, started, uh, we, we talked to the designer of Cabo and ended up getting the license to reprint it. And so we're actually reprinting the second edition of that because we liked it and modified the art and you know, um, mm -hmm. change some of the rules a little bit to make it, a, you know, kind of a little more um, modernized. Yeah, published back in 2010 or something. It's 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 been around for a while, and uh, you know, in between that process, um, I had been kind of taking a step back and looking at golf, looking at all these other games, and going, you know, these are so cool, but they're just not they're not deep enough. There's kind of this a really strong element of chance. Um, there, it's not it, they, they don't give the gamer a gamer enough options for it to be mm -hmm. really a solid game. and so i started kind of noodling around with uh, giving uh, different abilities certain cards and doing things and eventually ended up with silver which is you know pretty much every card has a special power that allows you to you know more quickly possibly get rid of cards or find out what your opponent's cards are and um there's there's such this big giant wide pool of things that you can do and even as I first was designing, I didn't realize this. And now that I'm a couple of years into it, and we have about 100 cards in a backlog that have all unique, <laughs> that, that, need, that they all need a home. And uh, you know, each set only takes 14 cards, so we've got you know a lot that but we'll be able to uh, you know nice. add to other sets going forward. Um, you know, it's just uh, there's there's something very compelling about it. The, the special power. Uh, that, that they each have and, and deciding when to use them. And, uh, you know, it, wow, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of addictive. And there's certain, there's a lot of people that have come up to me that we have an app that we made for it, for the game to get people, you know, to, so they'd understand kind of how it plays. Right. And a lot of people have said they've played the app, you know, hundreds of games of the app. And I'm not surprised because it has that kind of addictive quality of like, oh, oh, I didn't realize you could do this. I'm going to do this next time. And you try that. And, <laughs> and then, and then it opens up new possibilities. And, uh, you know, as we're adding these cards that have these special abilities and do more things, uh, it just opens the, 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 the space, the decision space is so interesting for such a simple idea of, hey, let's get rid of some cards and lower the sum of your cards. And, um, you know, it, the, because that core is so simple, it, people are able to, you know, it's very accessible. And the fact that it's really about the cards that have these different powers. So, you know, kind of comes back to where Suburbia is, where the game itself is, you know, you're taking a tile and you're putting it down. You can pretty much, you don't even have to know the rules of the game except for that, and it'll work for the most of it. If you can pay for a tile, you can put it in there. It may be good or bad, but you can do it. Right. Um, and you don't really have to know too much to be able to, to, to play the game. But to do it well, you have to understand how the tiles start to interact with each other. And you start to see those combinations, and you start to do things like, you know, advanced players of Suburbia, they will be in hopes of getting a recycling plant, which is this tile that gives you, I think it's a two reputation for every, well, I know it's two reputation for every adjacent yellow tile. You build a little hex, you know, maybe six sided if you're lucky, of yellow tiles, hoping for that uh, recycling plant to come out. Because when you do, you plop it down and suddenly you get 12 reputation towards the end of the game, which is huge. Um, you know, things like that, that you're, you're, you're thinking about the potential of what you could possibly do. Um, that's that's exciting, and having all the variability on the tiles as opposed to in the rules, and having to learn a bunch of rules. And just as the tile comes up, you can see, oh, I can see what this does now. And then the more you play, the more you realize, like, oh, now I can actually start to strategize by thinking about how these work. And the same thing right. happens with silver; that you don't really need to know the cards ahead of time. In fact, when we teach people how to play, we don't go through and tell them what all the cards do because sure. there's text in the cards that tells them that. We just tell them the basics of the game. 
and they have at it at that point. And then they discover how those cards work and how they start to work with each other and the combinations. And so that, that's kind of exciting. Now, our, with, with the potential for 100 cards and 100 cards coming at least, is, is there any way to control like what cards go in so that they work better together or anything like that? Or you're using- Yeah, yeah. so, so that's there? a great question. Um, the, the system is it's pretty simple. All the cards are numbered from zero to 13. And okay. there's four of each card, except for the zeros and the thirteens. There's two of those. And the way that I've set this up is that uh, there's categories for the cards. So, mm -hmm. for instance, the, the seven cards tend to give you information about your own cards because you're, you always start with face down cards. Uh -huh. and you only know some. The sevens give you information about one, two, three of your cards, um, and they do this in different ways. So the the first couple um, decks give you, uh, I think the first one, but the beholder gives you two, uh, lets you view two of your cards when you use the sevens power. The next one lets you see your entire village, all five cards, um, whether you've seen them or not, any face down cards, basically you can view. Uh, the one after that does something else that actually allows you to start, basically you're looking at all of your face down cards until you see one with a low value and that one you have to turn face up. And so there's all sorts of different ways and different combinations of that, but it's all a seven and the sevens all do that. And so when you, you can replace the sevens from one deck into another, if you like that seven, that's kind of coming, coming out in the third deck, if you like that better than the one in the first deck, you can just take that from there and put it with all the other cards from the first deck and use it that way. And you're not going to be missing, you know, kind of like one of the, the important things, which is being able to figure out what your cards is. Um, the 11s and 12s are really interactive type cards where they allow you to swap cards with other players um, mm -hmm. and move things around. Um, and they all do that in different ways. And so if you use the 11 and the 12 from, from Bullet, they're going to work a little differently than the 11 and 12 from the original uh, game. And that sort of thing is really cool, um, that wow. you know, there's these categories and fitting the cards into the categories and, and kind of tweaking them and knowing that, yeah, you know, if people swap something out for something else, they're not going to have some ridiculous, super chaotic deck of, of cards that everyone's just swapping cards all the time. That's all it does. But instead, it's limited to that, you know, those 11s and 12s where, where that, that sort of thing can happen. And uh, that, that makes the, the game feel much more structured. And I think as people are introduced to new decks, they already have a feel for what to expect on some of these cards. Okay. Now, the, the other question I have to have is, are, are you just married to the werewolf theme because you have a giant 12-foot tall werewolf in your booth every year? Is that like we have to we have to do werewolf games for the next four years to make sure that we offset the the spend of this, or is that just natural? <laughs> um, you know, it's I, I think it's an easy place to look when we're looking for a theme for, sure. for a game, and certainly for this one, um, it was we we actually went with a lot of there was a lot of different themes we could have gone with mm -hmm. this one, and this, you know. Again, it's werewolves. You can really make it anything. You can make the werewolves do anything you want to. But this is kind of fun. I mean, the idea behind Silver thematically is that the uh, you know you've got all these. You, every every player has a village. That's what their cards are. They represent a village, and the the player the characters on the cards are you know they tend to have special powers, and those special powers attract werewolves. Um, the the better their power, the more werewolves they attract. Werewolves are bad. Obviously, you don't want them in there. So sure. those numbers being werewolves, you want them as low as possible. You want to have the village with the fewest werewolves because otherwise your tourism is going to go down the tubes, I guess. Because in general, people don't like getting <laughs> by werewolves. Um, and of course, the, the whole silver concept comes in when that if you if you uh, are successful in at some part, what we call call in for a vote, which is you skip your turns because you think you have the lowest sum. Everyone else gets a turn. And if you do indeed have the lowest sum, you get zero for that round. And that's, yeah. that's great because you could have had in the teens or 20 or whatever the sum of your cards is, everyone else gets the sum of their cards. However, if you're wrong, if you don't have the lowest sum, you're going to get the sum of your cards plus 10. Okay. When you, in addition to that zero that you get, the silver part comes in and that you get the silver token. For the first game, it's an amulet, and that can be used in this next round to protect a card for the entire round. In the second game, it's a bullet. That can be used to kill a card. So you've got some high high value card that you just haven't been able to get rid of. You can place that bullet on it; it kills the card like it's it's not even there. Um, and each of the games is going to have their own silver token that does something, you know, uh, really interesting. I'm, yeah, I, I don't want to say too much because we haven't really announced the the next one in there. Uh, all I'll say is that uh, gamers are going to love this next one because it's <laughs> it is combo rich. Um, it's just amazing. There's, there's just all sorts of fun things you can do, um, and it definitely 
it it just feeds that gamer instinct. You know, I, I love combos. I love things like in Suburbia where you have, you know what, if I get this and I get this, that means that th these, this other tile is going to be so useful in the future. That's the sort of thing you're going to have with this third deck. And that, that's that, that kind of level of interaction that you have with the cards. And it's, it's super exciting. I think that's kind of the best part of any card game is when you can get card game with text. Let's be specific. When you can develop combos and synergies, I think that's when they really start to kind of evolve into more of a game than say something yeah. like just golf right where sure. it's it's pretty much just play a card things happen that's it you're just trying to yeah. get rid of things you know that goes back to our our roots in canasta and all the other games and uker and all that but when we can kind of elevate them and add the text to the card now we're we're able to have a lot more fun and develop those synergies and have have a lot more interesting stuff so i i I, I think I you made a convert. I think I will have to seek this out, Ted, and give this a try because okay. that okay. that actually right. sounds like something I would like. <laughs> yeah. okay. And I'm I'm giving you a guff about the theme, but you know what? I I get it. It makes sense. It works on many levels. It's a it's a brand. It's a theme, but it's not so overdone that I can't tell what boxes are yours and where they start and where they end like some other people who try to theme things together it can kind of they all look samey and i would argue that this isn't true at all with your stuff because i know what's one night i know villains i know they they all have a distinct feel to them so that's uh that's how you make it work people thanks Awesome. Um, you know what? I think this is an awesome place to wrap. I mean, we we, we have to save some stuff for the next time you're on. Um, so that is that is awesome. I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you so much for being on. Um, you know, this is a for us. This is closing out 2019. We'll be back next year. But this was this was the high one of the highlights of the year. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no problem. Well, that's it, people. So thank you, Dan, for pouring the drinks. Thank you, Mr. Allspock, for being on. And uh, be sure to play games with hexagons the next time. You game all night. Thanks for watching this week's episode. Join us next week when we play a game with the guest. If you enjoy our content, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Be sure to follow us on all forms of social media. Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are the best ways possible. Simply find us by searching for Game All Night Show. And of course, check out our website at GameAllNightShow.com. This Week and Each Week is made possible through the generous support of donors like these. Be sure to subscribe below and check out our latest videos. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Comcast called my wife and they're like, oh, why'd you leave? Would you come back? And my, she's like, you don't understand. My wife, my husband hates you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I have to do like twice as much editing on this episode than I normally have to do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if people notice that my glass filled up from the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.